Hey church, just a couple of quick announcements before we get started with our study tonight. Uh, first off, Jim Mobley was diagnosed with a very rare kind of leukemia. Uh, the doctors don't know exactly what they're going to do about it just yet. They think they're just going to wait for a minute and see how it progresses. But please be praying for Jim. Um, also, Jeff Macon is doing better. This is, I think, the third day without a without a uh, uh, fever. And so please be praying for him. Miss Maxine as well is dealing with a positive test. I haven't heard any symptoms from her yet, but um, please be praying for those two. And then Seth McMurray broke his arm last week, uh, the first week of school. So please be praying for him. I know that uh, that's not a fun time, but uh, but hopefully he'll, he'll progress really well and, and heal up quickly. So um, if you have any other prayer requests, just put them down in the chat or in the comments of this video. And I'll make sure that those are in the email bulletin this week. This week's midweek Bible study is a little different. What we're going to do is we're going to study a study from a, a man by the name of Cliff Goodwin. You probably know Cliff if you've been a member at Warm Springs Road for a while. If not, you need to get to know him. And I have a perfect way for you to get to know him. The reason why we're using his study tonight is because it is from Polishing the Pulpit. And you've seen a bunch of Polishing the Pulpit videos uh, in the past, but this week they actually launched the new version of what they call PTP 365, which is their on-demand Netflix style polishing the pulpit. And the reason why I wanted you to see this video, see this sermon from Cliff, and also to learn about the new Polishing the Pulpit 365 is because they are releasing PTP 2020 on 365 next week. So um, we're going to look into the possibility of getting a congregational plan for that. Um, but basically what it is, is it's like Netflix, but with hundreds and hundreds, and you're seeing them scroll on the screen right now, hundreds and hundreds and all, more than a thousand sermons and Bible classes for, for preachers and teachers and, and Bible class teachers and members and women and men and elders and deacons and every type of Every type of Christian that you can imagine, they have lessons for it. And so they've launched that this week. And so I wanted to use a video from there to, to help you remember that. And also be looking forward to uh, whether or not we can start a congregational plan. We'll, we'll talk about that this Sunday with the men. But uh, get on there and just peruse what you can and see. And you might decide to start a family plan in the, mean, in the meantime. But anyways, I hope you have a great week. Let's get started with our Bible study. What a marvelous topic, God-sized prayers. Begin reading with me at Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, God, and through him, God, and to him, God, are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. I thought about this passage as I was contemplating God sized prayers. Brothers and sisters, if you're here this hour, whether younger or older, it matters not. I want you to know and to realize that probably prayer is one of our most underutilized weapons, tools in the Christian's arsenal. God has the willingness, God has the intention, God has the desire for us to get so much more out of prayer. For us to be able to aid and accomplish so much more through prayer, it must be one of the most underutilized tools or weapons in our arsenal. 
So let's talk about God-sized prayers. My, <laughs> what a concept. How big is God? How great is God? Here the Apostle Paul seems to be carried away, as it were, with emotion as the Holy Spirit inspired him to really bring to a close this special subsection of Romans. In Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, you have a special subsection in the epistle in which the apostle has been dealing with Gentiles and with Jews, especially Jews, and, and how they relate to the Gentiles. But even more importantly, how God is big enough and God's plan is grand enough for both Jew and Gentile. God and His ways are past finding out. As we notice there at the end of Romans 11 and verse 33. Now, as I began thinking about God-sized prayers, it dawned on me that this study really involves more than just God-sized prayers. And so to talk about this, we need to talk about at least two other things. So number one, we're going to begin by talking about God-focused prayers. Number two then, we'll talk about God-sized prayers. And then finally, number three, I want us to talk about God-trusting prayers. Prayers. I believe all three of these concepts, all three of these ideas mesh, going hand in hand together. God focused, God sized, God trusting prayers. First of all, go back to Romans 11 and verse 36 with me, the concluding verse in this chapter. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. i tell you what we need as people. Very, very often what we need as people is a reminder. We need a reminder that everything around us, everything in this world, everything in this universe, we need a reminder that everything is about God. The way the Bible opens in Genesis 1 and verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible is a book about God. This universe is the creation about God, about God's glory. So many times what bogs you and me down as we live the Christian life is we lose sight of the fact that everything is about God. We lose sight of the fact that neither you nor I were created to play, as it were, the leading role. All of us were created to play supporting roles, not leading roles. God is in the lead. It is all about God. You were created for the glory of God, Isaiah tells us. You were created for God's good pleasure according to His will, Revelation 4 and verse 11. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about God. But how many times as we pray, would our prayers be more reflective of the idea seemingly that it's about me? It's about you. It's about us. Folks, that's a flaw. That's a problem. Romans eleven thirty six: Of Him, through Him, to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. You and I will find our greatest fulfillment. We will enjoy our greatest contentment and satisfaction only if and when we fulfill our God-given role. And our God-given role is to bring glory to God. It's all about God. When you and I play our role as supporting actors, so to speak, we can then find our greatest fulfillment, contentment, peace, and satisfaction. But our prayers need to be God-focused prayers. Now, turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 
Let's go together to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're still talking about God-focused prayers. But as we come to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 through 33... We're going to find some elaboration. We're going to find some detail as to what this means. God-focused prayer. Verse 31, Paul says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. I want you to underline that at the end of verse 31. Give none offense, verse 32. Give no occasion of stumbling, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles. Both of those sets would be understood as unbelievers outside of the church, nor, in the third place, to the church of God herself. Give no occasion of stumbling. Your role and my role as Christians is not to be part of the problem, but rather to be part of the solution. Not to be contributing to the blight of sin that is in this world, but to the best of our ability to abstain and to refrain and to contribute to the righteousness, the good that can only be in this world when men and women submit to the will of God. Give no occasion of stumbling. Verse 33, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. I want you to underline that concluding line in verse 33. Book ending, as it were, this brief reading, you've underlined the statement in verse 31, do all to the glory of God. And you've underlined the statement at the end of verse 33, that they may be saved. Friends, we can summarize the Christian life with two simple concepts. All that we do, all that we're about, number one, is to the glory of God. And number two, it is for the good of man. That's what you've underlined in your Bible. That's what God-focused prayers keeps in mind. I am praying, I am living, I am striving day by day. What I want above anything else is the glory of God. I want God's greatness. I want God's majestic, eternal glory to be seen, to be acknowledged, and to be recognized by all. And in that process, what's involved in the glory of God is the good of man. See, God is not one of these beings who is self-absorbed. See, people out in the world, atheists and infidels of various stripes, they don't understand God and, and often they charge God maliciously and they charge God falsely. They hear you and I talk about God's glory and, and everything's being about God and they think, well, God is just some kind of self-absorbed deity that cares about nothing or no one but Himself. That's totally untrue. God's love for man is unfathomable. Ephesians 3, verses 17 through 19. His love is really beyond the bounds of our comprehension. But it is only when man acknowledges and submits to his Creator that man can come to know his ultimate good. If it's good for man, truly good for man, it is to the glory of God. And if it is to the glory of Almighty God, it is ultimately, truly good for man. Reflect back with me to Matthew chapter 22. Do we not see these concepts, one primary, one corollary, do we not see these two concepts in the way that our Lord responded to the lawyer's question? Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. What is the great commandment in the law? Primary, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. The glory of God is preeminent. You were created to love God. You were created for God to love you. And then corollary or secondary number two, 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The glory of God, the good of man. Now, when you and I bow and we pray, Hopefully we pray every night. Hopefully we pray every morning. Hopefully we pray multiple times through the day. When you and I pray, are our prayers really God-focused? Do we have an appreciation for the big picture? Are we ever cognizant of what's going on? Friends, life is continually pressing toward an end. We exist for a purpose and God is bringing history to a glorious end. There's a culmination coming. Oh, it's so easy to get wrapped up in traffic. It's so easy to get wrapped up in what's for supper. It's so easy to get wrapped up in my boyfriend or in my girlfriend. It's so easy to get wrapped up in my job. Don't ever lose sight of the big picture. God is progressing history to an end. God is progressing your life and my life to a glorious end if we only submit. So I ask you again. When we bow and pray, whether at night or in the morning or throughout the day, are they God-focused prayers? Is the foundation under which or underneath everything you're praying, is that foundation the glory of God and the good of men? Is the backdrop behind everything you're praying, is that backdrop the glory of God and the good of man? If it's not, you're not praying God focused prayer. Friends, God is able to take care of the details. God is able to take care of the details. God knows what you're going through. And at the end, we're going to talk some today about God trusting prayers, but let me just throw it out here now. When we pray God-focused prayers, keeping our minds and our priorities in the right place, God takes care of the details. He takes care of you. All right, number two. I want you to go with me to the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 32. We've talked about God-focused prayers. Now let's talk specifically about God-sized prayers. I know that's the title for this session. But as I mentioned, I think in order to talk about one, we need to talk about all three. Specifically now, God size prayers. Friends, what I'm about to embark on with you is indeed challenging. Very, very difficult. Number one, it's difficult because of the nature of the topic. I'm about to try to talk to you about a being who is infinite. And that's not hyperbole. That's not exaggeration. I'm about to talk to you about a being who truly had no beginning. Now try to wrap your minds around that. Almighty God has no beginning. He will have no ending. By definition, God is transcendent. Preacher, what does that mean, transcendent? What are you talking about? By definition, God is completely above, beyond, different from you and me. By definition. Now now the beauty of the gospel is that this transcendent, infinite being who inhabits eternity... In the gospel, he becomes relatable. In the gospel, he he reaches down, as it were, his almighty hand to mankind. And that's the beauty of the gospel. But that being as it is, it still doesn't take away the fact that God is different. Oh, that's the understatement of the hour. (laughs) There is so much to God about which you and I cannot understand. 
So much we cannot fully appreciate. So number one, the nature of the topic makes this challenging. But number two, our familiarity with this reality makes it challenging. After all, most of us, I dare say, maybe not all of us, but most of us grew up all of our lives learning and being taught and accepting that, hey, God's limitless. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is omnipresent, all-existing. God's everywhere. Most of us probably grew up with exposure to those concepts. And thus, because of the familiarity with those realities, it's really challenging for me to try to jar you in your seat and to wake you up and to wake up myself and to remind us that when we pray, we are tapping into the power of someone who is beyond the limits of our comprehension. If you're in Jeremiah 32, I want you to notice with me at verse 17 where the prophet of old was carried away with emotion. I believe in Romans 11 as Paul got to that beautiful doxology. I believe the apostle was struck with deep emotion. But I know here, I know here in Jeremiah 32, 17 that the prophet was. Because in the old King James from which I read, the first word in the verse is an interjection. It's a word of emotion. Ah! Oh. That word only occurs a handful of times in the entire Bible. Ah, oh, Lord God! Behold, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Let me tell you something, friends. You underline that last statement at verse 17. There is nothing too hard for thee. And let me add this. When you underline that, I want you to know that there's a world of difference, a world of difference between accepting that statement and praying like you believe that statement. True or false? There is nothing too hard for God. True or false? Every one of us would nod our head. True, preacher. I've believed that all of my life. I've grown up knowing that. There's nothing too hard for God. How do you pray? How do you pray? You need to pray like there's nothing too hard for God. Now go with me to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I've chosen these two, one from the old, this one from the new, to point out that praying God-sized prayers means that we are fully acknowledging, although not fully comprehending, we are fully acknowledging that we are pleading, that we are invoking the, the power of a being so great that His power goes beyond the limits of our minds, even our imaginations. Look with me now in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto Him, God, that is able, circle that word, A-B-L-E. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Friends, there is so much thrilling information in that one verse that I suppose we could take the rest of our time and we could spend it right here in Ephesians 3 and verse 20. First of all, if we were to work in reverse through the verse, notice at the end of this verse that this transcendent, almighty power of God, notice where it is working. Where? In 
us. Wrap your minds around that. The power of Almighty God working in us. Back up earlier into verse 20. And notice with me as I alluded to a moment ago that God's power is greater than our imagination. Yes, we're dealing with prayer in this verse when Paul tells us that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask. Circle the word ask. Now you have two words circled in this verse. You have the word able, you have the word ask. Friends, I'm here to tell you, Paul's here to tell you, God is able. What I need to know is will you ask? That's what I need to know. That's what you need to answer. God is able. But we're not just talking about prayer. The word ask pertains to prayer. But what about that word think? (laughs) What about that word think? Sometimes we describe something as being beyond the bounds of our imagination. God's power is literally beyond the bounds of your imagination. Now here I am standing up here before you with the most difficult job of all, supposedly. How am I going to stand up here and relate to all of you the power of one that is truly limitless? Number one, I can't adequately do that. Number two, all of us have probably grown up taking that reality for granted. Oh yeah, God's God's omnipotent. We just nod our head. Yeah, God's got all power. And we go on about our daily lives. Folks, that's an earth-shattering reality. Because God has all power, (laughs) we've not even scratched the surface. How do you pray? If this verse doesn't shape, mold, and challenge your prayer life, what are you doing? How do you pray? Do you pray as if you're approaching the one whose power is limitless? Do you pray as if you're approaching the one for whom there is nothing too hard? Nothing too hard, Jeremiah said. Do you pray as if you're approaching the one whose power is beyond Hollywood? Anything that can be depicted on the silver screen. Whose power is beyond your feeble and my feeble imagination. Are you praying like that? Now as we talk about the power of God, And I touch on this a lot. If you've heard me speak at different times or places, you've probably heard me say this because this is something very important to me. But I want every one of us in this room to know, I want you to know two things. Number one, as per Ephesians 4, 11 through 14, and as per 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, I want you to know, number one, that the age of the miraculous is over. I believe that. Not only do I believe that, I know that because revelation has been completed. Jude verse 3. It's been once and for all delivered unto the saints. And the primary purpose of the miraculous was to confirm new revelation. Mark 16 verse 20. Hebrews 2 and verse 4. I want you to know, number one, that the age of the miraculous is over. But I fear that for too many of us, that's all that we know. And we think because the age of the miraculous is over that our prayers are hamstrung and that God's hands are tied. You don't understand the definition of transcendent. You don't understand the nature of God. Folks, an all-powerful, omnipotent God does not have to work a miracle to accomplish His will. 
So I want you to know, number two, that even though the age of the miraculous is over, that God's providence is still very much at work. Now, as we talk about, as we talk about God's sized prayers, you go back to Romans 11, we begin at the last verse, verse 36. Of Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. That's a God-focused prayer. But when you back up to Romans 11 and verse 33, and the apostle tells you and me that His ways are past finding out, now that's a God-sized prayer. You delve into the mysteries of the providence of Almighty God and you will rattle your brain. You can't plumb the depths of God's providence. But folks, God is at work. And by definition, an omnipotent being who has all power, He is able to work through His natural laws providentially, just like He is able to supersede His natural laws in order to work miraculously. That has ended. This right here is going on every day. How do you pray? How are you praying? I want to share with you a few things about the providence of God. I really don't know that we can speak much about prayer if we don't also tie in providence. When we speak of the providence of God, we're talking about God's working through natural law in order to accomplish His purposes in life on earth. I want you to know some things about this, number one. God's providence mysteriously, and I'm going to use that word a lot because it is a mystery. Because I can't, can't stand up here and pinpoint every instance of God's providence. I may say more about that in a moment. I cannot identify it and I sure cannot explain the ins and outs of it. Oh, by the way, this is how God's getting that done. I can't do that. I can't do that. So number one, God's providence mysteriously has a way of having the right people in the right places at the right times. And that brings a smile to my face because I can't explain how He does it. I don't know how He gets it done, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that He does it. You can go with me if you'd like to the book of Esther. The book of Esther in the Old Testament. You know Esther 4 and verse 14? Mordecai is speaking to Esther. And I'll paraphrase it here. Mordecai basically tells Esther, he says, if you don't step up and come to the aid of God's people, God is able to bring deliverance for another place, from another place. God is able to take care of it. As the late brother Curtis Cates told us, God is never caught off guard without any contingency. <laughs> God is never caught off guard for any contingency. God, Mordecai tells Esther, God would be able to deliver His people for another place. But then Esther 4 and verse 14, he asked Esther, he said, But who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for a time such as this? Folks, I can't explain it. I'm not even going to try to explain it. But I'll tell you this about God's providence. It has a way of having the right people in the right places at the right times. Esther is an example. Number two, when we consider the providence of Almighty God, now this is... <laughs> this has got to be one of the most frustrating realities for Satan. I don't have any pity for Satan. But I will admit that this must be one of the most frustrating bang your head against the wall realities for our adversary. And that is number two. God's providence is such 
that God in His infinite power is able to take evil, E-V-I-L, evil, and mysteriously, God without either being the origin nor being party to that evil in any way, no, 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 but yet God is able to take that evil and He is able to turn it to produce His will. Now you talk about a bang your head against the wall frustration for the devil. That has got to be a bang your head against the wall frustration. What are you to do? You do evil, you, you get evil going in the earth and then Almighty God turns it. God wins. Folks, if you can't get fired up about this, I don't know what to do with you. How are you praying? In Genesis 50 and verse 20, you had the evil of Joseph's brethren. Oh, they resented little brother Joseph. They envied him. They hated him. They intended it for evil. They sold him into slavery. And Joseph points out there in Genesis 50 and verse 20, he says, yeah, he says, you intended it for evil. He said, but God meant it for good. Folks, there's no way we lose. There's no way we lose. We're going to win. Because God's going to win. And because when you have an adversary that per performs evil and our great God turns it for good, we cannot lose. How are you praying? How are you praying? And then the ultimate example of this is Calvary. <laughs> Calvary. Satan and his cronies, they have taken the Son of God and they have nailed His precious body to a wooden cross. Finally, after six hours of agony, He gives up His spirit, slipping into the Hadean realm. And for one whole day on that Saturday, the black flags of hell wave at their highest. We have killed the Son of God. And God takes that evil and early Sunday morning God turns it. You're not going to lose. Why are we praying like we're going to lose? God sized prayers. Number three as we close. We need to be praying God trusting prayers. God trusting prayers. I want you to look with me to the book of James, James chapter 5. I love it. I really love it. When I find something in the New Testament that is telling me about an account in the Old Testament, but you search the Old Testament account high and low, and you never found this in the Old Testament. But you come over here to the New Testament, and the Holy Spirit has inspired a prophet or an apostle to record it for us now in the New Testament. I love that. In James chapter 5, we find specifically that Elijah initiated that three and a half year drought by praying. Look in James 5 and verse 17. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. Now you search the king's account high or low, you're not going to find this fact in the king's account. But James tells us that Elijah prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And boy, it didn't rain. It rained not for the space of three years and six months. Verse 18, now we, we see this, I believe, in the king's account. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I'm convinced that too seldom do you and I put ourselves in the shoes of Elijah. You want to talk about a man who is God-focused? You want to talk about a man who is God-trusting? 
Folks, he lived in Canaan. He was a citizen of Israel. When he prayed earnestly, God stop up the windows of heaven. God turned the spigot off, so to speak. God, don't let it rain. Don't let it do. God, bring us to our knees. Do you know what he was praying? He was praying difficulty and hardship for himself. He was the one that God would send down to a cave and he'd rely on the brook Kirith for water until it dried up and he'd be fed by ravens. He was the one then later that would have to travel up into enemy territory, the village of Zarephath, basically in the the shadow of Jezebel's stomping grounds, eight miles out of Sidon, all to go and be supported by a widow who couldn't even support herself or her son. When you pray God-sized prayers, God-focused prayers, you've also got to pray God-trusting prayers. Sometimes even praying yourself into difficulty. Why? For the glory of God and the good of man. Why else would anybody pray himself or herself into difficulty? Lord, make it harder on me so that my folks will repent. Who else is going to do that? You only do that when you are praying for the glory of God and the good of man. That's the only time you do that. And folks, you don't do that if you're not God trusting. The God who will allow you to pray yourself into difficulty is the God who will sustain you through that difficulty. Are you praying God trusting prayers? Elijah did. But perhaps there's no time more difficult for someone to pray God-trusting prayers than to pray those prayers repeatedly and for God's obvious answer to seemingly be no. But God, I've asked. James 4 and verse 2, You have not because you ask not. God, I've asked. God, I do your will. I'm obedient. 1 John 3 and verse 22. If we're not obedient to the will of God, we don't need to expect God to grant our petitions. But God, I'm obedient. God, I ask repeatedly. Luke 18, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. I've not asked once. I've not asked twice. I've asked three times or five times or ten times. God, I've asked. God, why are you telling me no? Because sometimes God's answer is no. And if you don't think that's a God-trusting prayer, I don't know what is. We have got to trust God's wisdom. We have got to trust God's goodness. We have got to trust God to answer our prayers in the way that He sees best. And that's what it means to pray a God-trusting prayer. Is there anyone whom God loves any more than His only begotten Son? He's called the Son of His love, Colossians 1 and verse 13. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the only accountable man to ever walk on the face of this earth and to live completely, entirely within the will of God, having never committed any sin, 1 Peter 2 and verse 22. And God told him no once. God told him no twice. God told him no three times in Gethsemane. Three times Jesus prayed, Father, if it be Thy will, let this cup pass from me. God said no. And friends, if God can tell His only begotten Son no, He can tell you and me no when it is in the best interest, number one, of His glory, and number two, the good of man. And God knows those things better than you and I. 
Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, what more faithful servant of the Lord do we have than the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul had this thorn in the flesh and he didn't pray once, he didn't pray twice, he prayed at least three times, God, remove this from me, please God. Couldn't I do so much more? God, couldn't I be so much more effective? God, take it away. And God said, no, no, no. We've got to pray God-trusting prayers. I love you. Have a great weekend. God bless.